Welcome to Wave Church. Um, so glad to see you all here this morning, um, especially a warm welcome to those of you who are first time guests or, or visitors in general. Um, such a blessing to have you here on this Advent Sunday. Um, I want to uh, point your attention to the Wave app. Um, if you aren't familiar with that, um, you can download it. And within that app, uh, there's a connection card. Uh, so those of you that are newer or visitors, um, if you'd like to get plugged in to WAVE, you can enter your name and email contact there. Um, we'll just use that to have pa Pastor Jason reach out to you and welcome you. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on at WAVE. We have life groups and events and Sunday school, and all of that is uh, pretty much communicated through the weekly newsletter, um, which gets emailed out. Um, so if you aren't getting that or you have a change in contact info, um, use that same app, use that connection card, update anything you need and, and get plugged in that way. Um, we'd great, uh, we'd you know, be happy to have you as part of the Wave family in that regard. Um, lastly, for, for offering, um, we don't pass around any bucket or basket, um, but you can easily give online through the app, um, the website, and I think we still are back to having a, a box back there. You can do it uh, in person as well. Um, so welcome, and welcome those of you online who are joining us. I'll pass it off to Jason. Thanks, Joanna. Good morning, Wave Church. Merry Christmas. Hey, we still have a lot going on. If you notice as you were coming in, there are some cookies outside with cookie tins. Uh, and so grab some. Those tins are for you. Uh, fill up on some cookies, take them home, make sure the kids don't eat them on the way home. Uh, and we have our Christmas Eve service coming up uh, on Christmas Eve. Uh, we were planning on being outside. However, if you've watched the weather, it's going to rain. So we are actually moving service inside. Uh, so make plans accordingly. We look forward to worship, or worshiping with you. It's going to be a great night. Uh, but welcome. I am Pastor Jason, lead pastor here at Wave. If you're watching online, let me give you a warm welcome. Uh, we have been in a series called Prince of Peace. Uh, in the Bible, uh, we hear Jesus described in several different ways. And one of the ways that he's described is the Prince of Peace. And so the Christmas story that we might be familiar with, and we're going to take a look at again uh, in Luke chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles or your iPhones, you go ahead and go there. Um, but the gift that Jesus came to bring us, we discover in the Christmas story, is peace. Peace with God, peace with one another, and even more peace with ourselves. Now, I don't know about you, but, but this year we could use a little bit more peace in the Hardy home, right? We've got three boys, they're growing, they're a little bit chaotic, our life is busy. And so every year around the Christmas time, we look forward uh, to taking a little breath, a breather. Uh, and so if you show up to church next Sunday, there's not going to be church because we're taking a break. Uh, if you show up the following Sunday, there's also not going to be church next Sunday because our staff is going to catch our breath. We're, we're trying to get a little bit of peace as well. Um, but the last several years, I think we can all agree, uh, haven't been very peaceful. Right? Our, our world feels a little bit chaotic. Uh, maybe you are coming into this Christmas season uh, with a bit, a bit of disappointment. And so this morning, the, the kind of question I want us to wrestle with is how do we find peace, particularly the peace of God, in the midst of disappointment? Okay, if you were to look up the definition of disappointment, it, it would simply read as this, a sadness or displeasure by the non-fulfillment of one's hopes and expectations. Right? When I, when I think about Christmas... Um, I can't help but think, you know, Christmas is full of disappointment, right? I remember my first time being disappointed in Christmas. I was 12 years old, and my big gift that I was asking for was a Sega Genesis, right? It was the first console that actually, see, Sam understands. He's shaking his head, right? It was the first console with an actual CD. It was the best video game system out there. None of my friends had had it yet, and I had hounded my parents for months for a Sega Genesis. And so I was certain my parents were going to get it for me, right? I had dreams of, of the hours of playing during Christmas break. And uh, so I run downstairs Christmas morning. I look under the tree and there is a box shaped like a Sega Genesis, right? I had like memorized the dimensions just so I could make sure that, that I was going to get it. And so I did what, what every kid usually does. I saved it to the end, right? Because you want to you wanna save the anticipation. And so I'd open up all of my other presents and my parents hadn't got me like any other games to give it away, right? And so I'm thinking that they've saved up. I'm getting the Sega Genesis. And so I was the last person to open up my Legos. There's no Sega Genesis. 
Usually my parents are here, and I would shame them for this, right? But <laughs> they're not. And so I can talk about them behind their backs, right? No second Genesis. And so there were little tears that came in my eyes. And my dad goes, son, this is Christmas. You need to go in the bathroom and clean yourself up. And I was disappointed. I was crushed, right? So I walk into the bathroom, and there was my Sega Genesis on the toilet, right? <laughs> if you're a parent, it's great. I, we've, we've abused our kids in that way many times, right? And so disappointed, right? And I walked in, and I was thrilled, right? The reality is with Christmas, for some of us, you know, we've kind of opened up life, and we don't like what we're getting. We might be disappointed. Right, we're coming to the end of this year, and I don't think any of us prepared for a lot. We didn't think this year was going to be great, right? Um, but maybe even as we're coming to the end of this year, we're, we're disappointed. And I think for some of us, um, there's no surprise gifts waiting in the bathroom. And, and so we would be remiss to just um, lie and say, man, this Christmas season's all about joy. The reality is for a lot of us, it, it's kind of a mixed bag, right? We we have this joy, and Christmas really is about family and us gathering together, but there's, there's some disappointments, some unfulfilled hopes and expectations, right? Disappointment is, is simply us placing our hope in the wrong things. And so when we come to the story of Luke and the Christmas story, um, I want to read it with just a different lens. You know, the reality is that I think we all come to the nostalgia of Christmas, and it, it wouldn't be right for us not to read Luke chapter 2 during the Christmas season. Um, but those who we see in this story, we can't help but realize they were disappointed. It had been 400 years since God spoke. No prophetic word. They're now occupied by Rome. Israel definitely was not great again. And so they're waiting and hoping for this promised Messiah. And so we find ourselves, maybe with a little bit of disappointment, reading a story about people that were disappointed as well. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1, is where we're beginning. We're told, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be registered. Well, it wasn't all the world, but the known world, Rome. And this was the first registration of Cornarius from the governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph went up to Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which was called Bethlehem, because he was from the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in that same region, the shepherds were out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news and great joy that is for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. What I love about this passage is how Jesus is described. You know, you've probably heard this uh, passage of Scripture preached every Christmas that you can remember. And what I find amazing is that every time we come to God's Word, there's always just little new truths that God can bring out. You know, if Jesus wanted to send us somebody uh, that would just give us better advice at how to live life better, He would have sent us maybe a counselor. Right? If, if he wanted us to have a, a better political system or somebody that would actually uh, lead us better, maybe he would have sent a politician. Right? If, if God wanted our enemies to be defeated, maybe he would have sent us a, a mighty king or a warrior. Now, Jesus certainly is given all those titles in different places, but in Luke, he's given the title of a Savior who is Christ the Lord. God said we needed a Savior. I, I love what Tim Keller says. I have this quote up on the screen for you. He says, Christmas is therefore the most unsentimental and realistic way of looking at life. It doesn't say, cheer up. If we can pull, we can pull together and, and we can make this world a better place. If you and I could pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we can come together and unite as humanity and make this world a better place, it would have already happened. We're certainly trying the best we can. And I think we've seen, even the last couple of years, sometimes we little get a glimpse of that, but, but man, this world is more divided than it's felt like it's ever been. Christmas is the most unsentimental, realistic way of looking at life. 
God needed to step in and do something because we couldn't. In fact, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down or put it in your app. Disappointment is the fruit of misplaced hope. Right? We can't help it. We place our hopes and things and people hoping that they'll deliver. Right? Maybe you find yourself coming to the end of this year. Uh, I made a, a resolution not to make any resolutions for this year because I had no idea what was going to happen. And, and maybe you find yourself coming to the end of the year going, man, I had hoped in some things and they just didn't pan out. They disappointed. God, you, you didn't deliver on maybe some of those hopes and expectations that I have. I found this quote from John Cheever this week and I, and I thought it was very poignant. He said, the main emotion of the American adult who has all of the advantages of wealth and education and culture is disappointment. We can't help it. We put our hopes in things that, that don't last, they don't sustain. And so we're told in Luke chapter 2 that God sent His Son, someone who we could place our hope in who would never disappoint. And we were told in verse 12 that this will be a sign for you. The angel is speaking to the shepherds that you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and laying in a manger. And we're told suddenly there was an angel, uh, a great multitude of angels of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace amongst those whom he is pleased. God shows up to some no-name shepherds and says, I'm going to give you a sign. And the sign was not the angels. The sign was that you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths laying in a manger. Now, what's the purpose of a sign? Well, it's meant to communicate something to us, right? To give us direction, to point at something, right? We often drive and there's signs that we pay attention to. And if you don't, uh, it could lead to disaster. Signs are, are given for a reason and a purpose. And so God says, I'm giving you a sign, the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths laying in a manger. Now, here's where we don't understand what is being talked about in the scripture, because we're not shepherds. Let me tell you a little interesting fact. Bethlehem was known for unblemished lambs. This is taking place in Bethlehem. And so unblemished lambs, if you're familiar with Jewish custom, uh, once a year a family would either go buy an unblemished lamb or they would raise one and they would go sacrifice it in the temple to atone for their sins. It was a part of life. And so Bethlehem specifically was known for their unblemished lambs. And so shepherds, when they would find an unblemished lamb, usually a little newborn baby lamb, they would wrap it tight in swaddling cloths. And they would actually lay them in the mangers, the feeding troughs. The, they were not made out of wood like the one we got. Usually they were made out of stone. And they would lay those newborn lambs in the manger, in the feeding troughs, to keep them safe from the other lambs so that they could be sold and then sacrificed. And so God shows up with some angels to some no-name shepherds, but they're Bethlehem shepherds, who thousands of times would have wrapped up these lambs and placed them in the manger, and they said, or the angel said, the sign will be what? A baby wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. They understood what the sign meant, that this baby would grow to become a sacrifice. In the scriptures, we're told that, that Jesus would be the once and for all atoning sacrifice for the sins of humanity. That he would become our Passover lamb, our atoning lamb. That is the sign. And so Tim Keller says this, There has never been a gift that's been offered that makes you swallow your pride to the depths that the gift of Jesus Christ requires us to do. Christmas means that we are so lost and so unable to save ourselves that nothing less than the death of the Son of God could save us. This means that you are not somebody who can pull yourself together and live a good moral life. Amen? I think some of us are tired of trying to fool ourselves that we can. What an incredible gift. Verse 15, we're told, when the angels went away from heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened which the Lord has made known to us. Then they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby laying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known everything that was told to them of this child. And all who heard it wondered and pondered in their hearts the shepherd, everything the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen 
Whenever I think of this passage, I can't help but think of all those little nativity scenes in our home, right? How many of you have a nativity scene in your home? It's like right up front and center, right? In our family, we used to uh, fight over who got to set them up. You know, I'd put baby Jesus away because baby Jesus doesn't come until Christmas Day, right? Um, theologically, if you have your baby Jesus out, you're doing it wrong, right? Uh, I put G.I. Joes in there, right? I was just compelled by it. We're drawn to it. It's all cute and cuddly and cozy, and um, there's a little bit of nostalgia with our, our nativity scenes. And so what I want to do for a moment is ruin our picture of the nativity. Because as I look at this picture, as we read this story, the reality is it's anything but comfy and cozy. Uh, it is not peaceful. Let's just think about this story from a different lens for a moment. Angels come declaring to a teenage girl that, that you are going to get pregnant. And, and she declares, uh, Lord, let it be done. And as soon as she says that, her whole life unravels. Right? Her, her husband, uh, her fiancé, didn't do it. He's thinking about divorcing her. They end up traveling at nine months pregnant to Bethlehem. Um, they've been mocked. They've been ridiculed. They've been humiliated at this point. The reason why there's no place for them is because nobody in the family is willing to take them in. You would have imagined a teenage girl would have dreamed of her wedding day. She never got the wedding day. You can imagine that, that when you get pregnant, you, you dream of being able to have your child, maybe with your mother around or with your family, and there's going to be a celebration. There's going to be no celebration for the birth of this child. We're told that after Jesus was born, the King Herod realizes that there's another king in town, and so he decides to kill every child under two years old, which causes Mary and Joseph and little baby Jesus to flee to Egypt. They're now refugees. This is not a peaceful moment. The moment is full of heartache and trouble and disappointment because they're doing exactly what God wanted them to do. This is beyond 2020 or 2021 disappointment. Unfulfilled hopes and expectations. So if you find yourself this Christmas season with a little bit of disappointment, what I want to do is I want to pull out two truths from this text um, that maybe will bless you over the next couple weeks. The first truth that I want you to write down is simply this. You don't have to understand the plan. Trust that God has a purpose. We see this all over the story. You don't have to understand the plan to trust that God has a purpose. Mary and Joseph have no idea what God is doing. Now, God has given them a little bit of hints. Hey, you're going to get pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's never happened before. That's kind of weird. Um, it happened, right? They had no idea how Jesus would actually become the Savior of the world. In some ways, that was a gift, right? Could you imagine if Mary knew the things that Jesus would have to go through to become that Savior? Thank God. I don't think any mother's heart could handle that. We're told Mary treasured all of these things and pondered them in her heart. That's Bible talk for she didn't understand what God was doing, right? She's pondering them. She's wondering, you know, is there this majestic reality here? I think she's stressed. I think she's overwhelmed. I think she's, she's going, God, what the heck are you doing? I love Proverbs 19. It says this, many are the plans in the minds of man, but it's the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Many are the plans in the mind of man. Right? You probably have some plans for what this Christmas will look like. You have some plans for what this last year would look like. But I love the second half of this verse. The purpose of the Lord will stand. You know, Joseph had some plans. In Matthew chapter 1, we're told uh, that he, being a just man and unwilling to put Mary to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. My wife's pregnant and I didn't do it. I'm going to divorce her. But as he considered these things, we're told, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is indeed from the Holy Spirit. She will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He had a lot of plans. Joseph probably dreamed of what life was going to look like. But we're told that God's purpose prevails. You know, there's a lot of plans that I had over the last couple of years. Um, I think all of us had some plans that, that definitely did not come to fruition, but the promise of the Lord still stands. Mary and Joseph live, they're wrecked, right? They're crushed. Life looks nothing like what they were expecting. 
You don't have to understand the plan to trust that God has a purpose. The second truth that I want to give us is that your disappointment is a divine invitation to trust God. Your disappointment is a divine invitation to trust God. You know, as I look at the life of Jesus, I realize that there has never been a single person, not even Jesus, who God chose to give all the details to. Even Jesus didn't understand all the details of what was going to transpire. We're told that Jesus, when he took on human flesh, that that he was tempted in every way like we were, but was without sin. And so all of the, the understanding he relinquished in many ways, he understood what his role was going to be, uh, but he even told his disciples, I don't know when the Father's going to bring to fulfillment everything. And so let me tell you a little story to illustrate this point that I, that I think maybe would um, bring this home for us. Our disappointment is a divine invitation to trust God. I graduated high school in 1999, uh, and there was a song in 1999, right? We're going to party like it's 1999, right? So that was our theme song. And so at, at 18 years old, um, I had all of life figured out. I mean, I was the smartest, most brilliant kid in the world, right? I totally knew the plan of my life. And so I had gotten into San Diego State. I was going to be an aerospace engineer, and my minor was going to be in partying because they wrote a song uh, in 1999. And so that's what I did. And I discovered I was really good at, at my minor and not so great at my major. <coughs> and so over the years, I would remember there would be these moments where I would think, man, on the outside, life is just great, right? Going to San Diego State, having a blast. We live by the beach. You go surf. And yet there was just this lack of peace. Everything in life just looks great on the outside, but there is just this, this hole in my life. And at 22, all of those bad decisions and minoring and partying had caught up to me. And there was this moment where I just looked at my life and I just go, man, it is such a mess. I thought I had life figured out. Four years later, I'm like, I have no idea what the heck I'm going to do. My life is a disaster. And I found myself in a divine disappointment and I prayed. Probably the first time I had prayed in years. And my prayer was a simple one, and it was a humble one. And I just simply said, Jesus, if you can make anything out of this mess of a life, it's yours. And I would love to say that miraculously my life changed right away. It didn't. Uh, I did find myself going to church and um, trying to really seek after what the Lord's heart was for my life rather than just my own desires. I'd stopped dating for, for a while, and, and I found myself working in a junior high ministry, and that was a miracle itself because junior high is they still scare me, right? And I have several of them in my house now. Um, all kinds of hormones, right? And testosterone. And, and I found myself falling in love with God's word and realizing, man, I can help people discover Jesus. And God was beginning to reveal more and more to me. In my disappointment, it was an invitation to trust him. And, and, and I'm not going to lie, there were still disappointments even then. I actually had become an electrician for a season because I had no idea what, what I wanted to do with my life. And then I thought, maybe God wants me to be a pastor. So I walked off the job. And at this time in my life, I was cleaning toilets for the preschool that was on our church property so I could do ministry. Not a winner, right? Uh, If I had a daughter and she told me, hey, I fell in love with this guy that's cleaning toilets and he wants to be a junior high pastor, I'd say, keep looking, right? (laughs) And so one summer, Angelina, my now wife, came home. Lo and behold, several of her siblings were in our youth group and I was ministering to them and I had no idea that they had a sister. And she says, hey, can I volunteer in the youth group? Hello, yes, yes, you can. Um, From the day I met my wife to the day that we got engaged, which was like six months later, and then we were married 11 months later, I don't do that. Um, God began to reveal to me, right? In the midst of disappointment, um, we can trust him. You don't have to understand the plan to trust that God has a purpose. And I'll be honest, the the one prayer that I still find myself praying um, 18 years ago, almost 18 years ago since I prayed that prayer, is still very similar. Lord, if you can use this messed up life for your glory, I pray that you would do it. Our disappointments are a divine invitation to trust God. So let me ask the question, 
what is the disappointment that you're holding on to this season? What is the hope or the expectation that that has gone unfulfilled? And maybe we even find ourselves um, resisting going to God with it because, you know, it's been a long time. It's a divine invitation to trust him. Let me flash forward a bit in our story. Mary is now an older woman. Her husband Joseph has died. We no longer see him in the scriptures after Jesus was about 12 years old. She has seen her son begin teaching and preaching and doing miracles. The crowds have started to follow. She begins to see that promise that God had given her begin to unfold. I mean, she was told that her son would be the savior of the world. You think your kids are great? Her kid was better, <laughs> right? No angel showed up telling you that your son's going to be the savior of the world. And if they did, we might need to have a conversation, right? She's seen him beaten and scourged. She watched his flesh get ripped open. I mean, could you imagine she watched Jesus, her son, the perfect son of God, sinless, never sinned against anybody, never did anything wrong, drag his cross up to the hill of Golgotha and was nailed to it. In John chapter 19, Mary finds herself at the feet of Jesus, her son, as he's dying on a cross. And we're told that Jesus' clothes were um, split up and cast lots for. There's people spitting at him and mocking him. We have one criminal on one side that's kind of making fun of him. Uh, it's a show. And we're told standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, this is John, uh, Behold your mother. And from, uh, and from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Mary was a widow. The only way she would have made it in life was her kids. And Jesus has the wherewithal as he's dying on the cross to say, John, take care of my mom. Mom, John's going to take care of you. Do you think Mary's disappointed? Yeah. The perfect son of God. Supposed to be the savior of the world. She watched him grow. She had hopes and dreams for him as well. And he's dying. And he would be buried in a tomb, and his tomb would be covered with a stone. She had no idea. She was disappointed. But she didn't need to understand the plan to trust that God had a purpose. She had no idea that three days later that Jesus would actually rise from the grave and that his death would defeat sin and death and Satan on our behalf. She could have never understood that, even though Jesus told them several times, right? It's just you kind of read the Gospels, you go, come on, guys, like he said this was going to happen. They didn't get it. You know, the only reason you and I can even gather here together and celebrate Christmas is because Easter happened. Right? If, if the promise that this child who was wrapped in swaddling cloths laying in the manger is going to become the savior of the world and, and he was just a great teacher, I don't think we celebrate Jesus' birth. Right? Because Christmas is pointless without the finished death and resurrection of Jesus Christ at Easter. And so as we look at this Christmas story, we look at the nativity, man, it was anything but peaceful. It was full of disappointment. And if you have disappointment right now, you're in, you're in good company. It's why God came. All the way since Genesis, we're told that God promised to redeem, to put things right again. And this side of life with Jesus, um, we will still have disappointments. But two truths. You don't have to understand the plan to trust that God has a purpose. There's going to be a lot of unanswered questions this side of heaven. Truth number two, our disappointments are a divine invitation to trust God. And sometimes he gives us those small glimpses where he, re he really does redeem our stories. And other times we'll see that redemption when we sit with him in eternity. Let's pray. Bland, you can come forward. Lord, we thank you for, uh, for being our Savior.
Lord, every year we come to this season and we've heard these scriptures before. And Lord, I pray that you would meet us just in the midst of this place as we worship you. Lord, as we head into celebrating Christmas. Lord, with all the nostalgia, Lord, it could be um, hard to carry our disappointment in the midst of it as well. And so, Lord, would you just meet us in those places that we have unfulfilled hopes and expectations? Jesus, you really are um, worthy of our trust. And Lord, you do never disappoint. You might not give us what we had maybe hoped for or expected, Lord, but you give us better. And so, Lord, would you calm our spirits? Would you bring joy uh, out of the ashes? Lord, I pray a blessing over our church, Lord, as we head into uh, family gatherings, as we travel. Uh, Lord, there's still sickness out in this world. Would you keep uh, us safe and healthy, Lord? But I pray that you would keep us uh, focused on you. Lord, that we indeed would have our eyes fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 12, 5 through 6 says, Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done glorious.